Thank you for downloading our podcast. Zechariah is a prophet who delivers a message to Israel regarding their national failure to prioritize the rebuilding of God's temple. We might say, well, this is only a building. So what really is the big deal? The big deal is that we see a deeper problem in the stalling of the construction project. The problem in the issue is whether the Lord really can build his people in his city into a place that is worthy of his dwelling. So can the Lord build his city? Is the Lord sovereign enough to bring his redeemed people into his presence as he has promised at the exit of Eden? Please stay tuned to this series on Zechariah, where we consider the night visions. Are they visions of doom or deliverance? Well, if we think back to a story that may or may not um, be familiar to us in the scriptures, We think of Genesis 32, the story of Jacob wrestling with God. I think an important text to call to our minds when we read Zechariah 10. And in Genesis 32, if you remember the context of the story, you have Jacob, who's about to meet his estranged brother Esau. After deceiving him, stealing the birthright from him, he's convinced Esau is going to murder him. He sees no hope. He sees no resolution in that. So Jacob, after arranging his family, he takes Leah's children and handmaids and puts them first. So if Esau does attack, at least they'll fight first and hopefully Jacob and his uh, treasured wife would be able to flee uh, with his treasured children. But we find that as he sets this all up and then he prays and, and bows before the Lord, he sends his family on the other side of the river Jacob himself is alone. There's a stranger who wrestles with him in the night. And as Jacob wrestles with this stranger throughout the night, we find that this is God himself. Jacob himself says, I have looked upon the face of God and names that very place Peniel, basically looking on the face of God. And as Jacob has done that, he realizes that he has lived. The schemer the one who continues to manipulate any way he can as we look at his life, comes to grips with the reality that he is the one who is not going to prevail against this stranger. Recognizing who this stranger is after this stranger dislocates Jacob's hip, Jacob begs him for a blessing. The name that is given to him is moved from Jacob, supplanter, heel grabber, manipulator, all these things we see in Jacob's life, and is moved to Israel. Literally, may God strive. And the summary of Israel is you have striven with God, you have prevailed. And so when, when we have that as a backdrop, with Jacob always resting in his own strength, resting in his own abilities, and then coming to grips with weakness, sets the stage of this text. We may wonder then, how does it set the stage of this text? Why is the story of Jacob or the origin story of the people of Israel so significant that God is the one who strives, Jacob is the one who prevails in this striving, uh, in the irony as he's actually defeated and brought low? And so what is the ultimate resting point? Well, as we consider this, we're just going to divide this into two points. We're going to see first that there's a true God. And secondly, there's a true defender, something we, we all struggle with, if we're honest. Israel struggles with it. Jacob struggles with it. Abraham struggles with it. And it's the reality of what the Lord is putting forth in this text. And so let's begin with the true God in verses 1 and 2. Now, when you look at, at this, these two verses, we may say, well, how can they be so significant? Uh, Some individuals, and they've gone through this and preached on this, they've just preached on verses 1 and 2. And there's actually that much substance uh, right there. When we think about verses 1 and 2, and we put this in the context of chapter 10, the context of Zechariah, in the context of, of Scripture, we have to remember what the Lord has just said in Zechariah 9. Remember, there's a promise of the Lord who's going to ride into Jerusalem on the purebred donkey. We've seen that this isn't just a sign of humility, it's a sign of royalty. It's it's sort of a a royal procession, or what we would have as the presidential limousine uh, would be a way of putting it in our culture. Remember, 
uh, that we have Saul's family offering David a gift of the purebred white donkeys for the royal family to basically parade around Jerusalem in. And so when, when we have this identity, we, we find that there's sort of this positive and negative of going on with Christ entering into Jerusalem. On the one hand, he's going to walk into to Jerusalem be received as a king. We also know he's going to be rejected. We know of the cross. We know of the resurrection. And we know ultimately of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And so we, we, we see this pattern of a king coming to his people, being rejected, and then we find that uh, the gospel goes forth and we have the Pentecost event, the book of Acts, ultimately to where we wait till Christ comes again. We saw last time then we have the promises of God realized in the Spirit and we wait for the fullness. So with that as a backdrop to that, we say, okay, so basically Zechariah 9 is presenting this, this big picture view of how God works and the pattern of what God's doing. Zechariah 10 now is sort of pulling us back in to particular problems that's going on with the people of Israel. And that the people of Israel, what we're finding is, is it begins with this command, ask rain from the Lord. That's why I wanted to read from James chapter 4. We, we can see that we struggle with these same sorts of things, don't we? And so in, in terms of, of Zechariah 10, this ask rain uh, from the Lord, is the Lord giving this command? And as he gives this command, it's a struggle that Israel has had as they've trust Baal, the storm god. Let's do something to appease Baal. Uh, let's, let's make sure that, that we can bring rain uh, through Baal and, and worshiping him, but also we'll, we'll keep God in our back pocket too. And so you, they, they may not necessarily turn 100% from the Lord, and they, they just say, well, we're just incorporating other gods. What Zechariah is exhorting us to do is to understand this is not appropriate. We don't have the God of heaven plus other gods that we trust in as a backup. There is no plan B. We trust in the Lord. This, this is a call, a rather strong call that's going on. And Zechariah is calling Israel to basically say, live boldly before the face of God. Your God cares for you. Your God provides for you. Your God cares for the creation. Doesn't Christ assure us in Matthew 5? The lilies of the field, he assures us that, you know, the rain comes, the birds of the air have food. All these animals uh, find their nutrition, their life, and live out their days by God's provision. Christ himself, Matthew 5, verse 45, reminds us that God is the one who sends a rain on the just and the unjust. Those who see it coming from God and those who do not see it coming from God. And so it's the same reminder and exhortation. Trust in the Lord. Understand that the Lord is the one who's a great provider. As James reminds us, why don't we have? Well, we ask wrongly. We, we ask to spend it on our own passions, on our own desires, and, and not for the glory of God. And so when, when James gives this exhortation, calls us back to God, it's very much along the lines of what Zechariah is saying. So what, what are they doing? What, what's going on with the people of Israel? Well, we find that as the Lord is the one who sends the rain, he sends the showers. And again, that reminder, talk to your God. Ask him, pray to him. He, he hears your prayers. He wants you to pray to him. Pray to him. But we find in verse 2 what's going on with the household gods. Uh, literally, the teraphim is, is what this is uh, basically coming over from the Hebrew. These are gods that are used to tap into the realm of the dead. And as they're tapping into the realm of the dead or, or to the dead individuals or to those who go into Sheol or, or whatever um, this particular philosophy or religion may be bringing out, what we find with Israel is basically going into Sheol or, or used as going into the sea as the analogy here. And as they go into the sea, there's, there's this mindset, well, the dead know what's going to happen in the future. Well, Scripture actually gives us an eye into this, literally allowing us to see into the realm of the dead. We think in Revelation 6, verse 10, where we have the souls of the saints who are under the altar, the martyred ones. And what do they say? How long, O Lord? So even the saints, in the presence of God, and in the realm of the dead, under the altar, do not know the future. 
They do not know when Christ is coming again. They do not know when the Lord's going to set up the glorious kingdom. Now, these household gods are not just a problem for Israel. Again, we go back to the story of Jacob and his history and part of his scheming. We find that Jacob's treasured wife, Rachel, as they flee from Laban, because Jacob gets out Jacob by his father-in-law, gets out schemed. And so Jacob leaves. And as he leaves, Laban chases him down. And what is Laban doing? As Laban chases him down, he's looking for the household gods, the teraphim, same word, same identity here. And as he's looking for these household gods, Rachel deceives him and basically makes it so he can't take the gods home. Now, we don't know why she took the gods. I mean, uh, commentators and the most optimistic side of it say, well, maybe she didn't want her dad to fall into pagan worship. It's possible. Or maybe she herself struggled with idolatry, which is also possible. But the reason I call this story to your attention is to get to the, basically the, the essence of the absurdity of idolatry that Zachariah is hitting on. Rachel stole the gods. Laban has to rescue his gods, right? And so we're, we're seeing sort of the irony of idolatry. What, what do we want as human beings? What does Satan hold out? The idea that we can be God and put God in his place. So what kind of gods are we going to create in our own minds? Gods that we protect. Gods that we determine the terms. Gods that that we can pursue on our terms, on what we desire. You see, this is a problem of idolatry. We, We completely reverse the gospel, don't we? We're not turning to Christ. We're not resting in Christ. We're not putting on the yoke of Christ, which is why I wanted to read from Matthew 11. We're not thinking about how do I take the yoke of Christ upon me more consistently so I live more to his honor and glory. Now, in terms of idolatry, we ourselves may say, well, we don't have the same thing. We don't have teraphim in our house. We don't have these little gods, these baby Buddhas, whatever we want to call it. Now, not that I endorse everything from Tim Keller, But one of the things he gives us that I think is pretty helpful in terms of diagnosing potential idolatry. Where do our minds go when we daydream? What do we think about? Now, I'm not saying everything we think about when we daydream is necessarily sinful or wrong. But these are things that can potentially pull us away from our affection of God. That's what Zachariah is calling us to do, calling us to think about. Think about the absurdity of idolatry. Think about what we want to serve and what we want to do. We, we all have these things. We all struggle with it. And this is where it's important you put Zechariah 10, 1 and 2 in the context. He's saying, listen, it's absurd to go to the diviners. They're lying to you. It's absurd to try and go into the realm of the dead. Even if you could talk to the dead, which, which I'm not saying we can, we find that the dead don't even know the future. And so stop coming up with gods that you want to serve by your own mind. And so when we hear this, say, okay, this is a reminder. We are those who struggle. We are those who struggle. We are those who wander. And we find that there's a problem. They have a lack of a shepherd, we find in verse 2. And so this is where you're setting up the stage from Zechariah 9, of the shepherd coming to Jerusalem, Ezekiel 34, the promise of God himself, coming to shepherd his people. God himself is going to shepherd his people. This is why we're called back to God. Come to your shepherd, hear the voice of your shepherd. So the true God through his prophet, verses 1 and 2, is reminding us of the problem. Not seeing the true shepherd, not asking the true shepherd, not seeing the purpose of the true shepherd, and sort of wandering away. Now we find that there is a true defender. Now verse 3 is pretty harsh. Because when we go to verse 3, we, we begin with this new section of now, the Lord's talking about the inadequacy of the false shepherds. And he's upset with these false shepherds. So now when we hear this, we might say, well, what, what is a false shepherd? Well, a false shepherd is someone who's going to call your attention and your affections away from the living God. A false shepherd is going to use the sheep or the church for his own benefit, for his own gain, for his own purpose, and not seek to discern the wisdom of God. 
And so when the Lord says, my anger is hot against the shepherds, he may say, well, then this means that there's some shepherds who are perfect and some that are not. Well, I don't know if we could ever say there really is a perfect shepherd on this earth. The perfect shepherd is in heaven. And I say that because we have Zechariah 3. Remember Zechariah 3? Who, who's the shepherd there? We think of Joshua the high priest, who actually was a pretty faithful man overall in terms of how we look at his life and evaluate it in terms of someone who's trying to discern the will of God. But yet we have Satan taking the accusation and bringing the accusations against him. And the Lord is the one who takes the accusations and Joshua has no defense. So when we hear this as well, we may say, well, then who can be a shepherd? Who can do this? Where is the hope? How do we know where truth is? How do we know where falsehood is? If even Joshua himself, there's legitimate accusations where the angel of the Lord has to change his clothing and take his garments away. Well, this is where we have to go on in the context. Because we, we can pull into a section, we can just look at verse 3 and say, see, here we have those who are just the false shepherds, period. Shepherds are false. We don't need church. All churches are evil. We don't need to go to church at all. When we look closer at the parallel, where it's hot against the shepherds, I will punish the leaders. Now, the leaders is actually the he goats. And so you're, you're finding out what the fundamental problem is. That the shepherds of Israel are not tuned in to the purpose of God. They do not care about the purpose of God. They're not wrestling with the purpose of God, not discerning the will of God. They are the he goats. They're not regenerate. They are not those who are part of God's fold. Now again, this is God saying this through a prophet as one who is omniscient. God is omniscient, speaking his words through his prophet. The prophet is not all-knowing, but God himself is. And so the Lord gives us warning that he will punish the shepherds. We think of Ezekiel 34, John 10, the setting of that context. Ezekiel 34, the warning of the shepherds who aren't caring about the sheep. They're not loving the things of God. They're not caring about the oppressed. They're not caring about the orphan, the widow, etc. They're only trying to benefit themselves in terms of what they do. And Christ himself in John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. Now as we hear this and we understand this promise, what is he going to do? Well, through the house of Judah, he's going to build this majestic shepherd. He is going to overcome. So Christ himself, or from the line of Judah, there's a one who's going to walk into Jerusalem, who's going to overcome. He's going to make his people like the purebred, um, powerful war horse. And so you're, you're seeing this transformation of a people who stand up to war. Uh, again, if you study the history of of horses and the history of the battle horse. The battle horse, when it smelled blood or it sensed battle or it heard the swords, the rider had to pull back on that horse with everything he had to make sure that horse did not rush into battle. They loved it. It was part of their competition, part of their nature and who they were. And so when he uses this language, he's saying he's going to raise up his people to be like this, fighting his cause, wanting to have this passion for his goodness. Notice then that we have this promise of who he is, of this one in many, that the one shepherd from the tribe of Judah, we have him who's going to be the cornerstone. So we think of like Ephesians 2.20, where we have the prophets, apostles, Christ being the cornerstone. So the foundation of God's revelation, Christ being the one that holds this whole revelation together. He's going to be like a tent peg, Isaiah 22, 23, the Lord's going to do this for the house of David. The promise of the battle bow. Again, we think of common grace, the Lord putting down his bow for a time, is speaking of when he picks it up and makes war. Uh, we have verses 4 and 5. As he becomes this cornerstone, this tent peg, this battle bow, he's going to make every ruler, all of them together. And he says they, so it goes plural. So it's the Lord and his people are going to engage in this battle together. So it's recalling for us where I wanted to begin our call to worship from Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Christ being the one who's rejected becomes a cornerstone that holds this whole thing together. 
Now we ask then, how is the Lord ultimately going to do this? Well, I will strengthen the house of Judah. He's going to save the house of Joseph. I mean, think about this. It's a wonderful thing. The favored son of Jacob that, that he valued above the others, where Joseph has a vision of being a king and all his brothers end up, you know, desiring to kill him and ultimately get sold into slavery in the story of Jacob and the patriarchs, we have that he's going to save this favored son. He's going to have compassion on them. We, we know the reality of the Lord seeing his people in their plight. But we skip down to verse 7, where we even heard in Hebrews 11 of Jacob blessing his sons, the story of Ephraim, a, a theme that comes in Scripture and is very important. Ephraim and Manasseh. At the end of Jacob's life, remember the story of how Jacob stole his brother's blessing, why he was fleeing, where he began in the sermon. Jacob's fleeing because his brother's going to kill him. Jacob's trying to seize a promise in his strength, his strength, his strength, his strength, his strength. That's what you find in the theme of Jacob's story until he wrestles with God. You find with Joseph taking his two sons to his dad, who is now dim, we think of Isaac dim in vision, not seeing clearly, right? And so he wants to bless the older son to bend the hand of God. We have now Jacob, who's dim in vision, but sees clearly. And as Joseph takes Jacob's arm and places his hands on an, in the appropriate way, so his left hand's going to be on Ephraim's, it's an inferior blessing. His right hand's going to be on Manasseh, it's a superior blessing, because Manasseh's the oldest. Jacob reverses his hands and understands that the Lord's strength is shown through weakness. And so we have to hear this when, when the Lord speaks of picking up Ephraim as a war bow. Basically, the weakest one, not even a direct child of Jacob, not even a direct child of Israel, a grandchild who's younger is the one that he is going to pick up. And he's going to do this. The Lord is going to show his strength. Notice that in verse 8, where it has that language of the whistle. That again, this is recalling for us along the lines of John 10, with Christ as a good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. We've talked about this before with John 10. The shepherds, they, they could basically put all their sheep in pens, and the shepherds would camp at night. You'd have all the sheep in, in one pen. You'd sleep in different shifts, make sure nobody steals sheep or, or harms the sheep in any way. Well, the shepherd in the morning could stand before the pen do a click, do a whistle, something with his mouth, and no sheep would come out of the pen and go right to the shepherd. They knew their shepherd. That's the language here, that the Lord is going to whistle and his people will come together. Notice the beauty of this, and we say, well, why is that important that he merely whistles and his people come together? Because they are scattered throughout the nations. So when we ask ourselves, well, what's the significance of the exile? What is the pattern there? Well, as the Lord sends his people into a foreign land away from Jerusalem, this shepherd is so faithful to his people that he merely calls out. No matter where they are, they don't even have to be in the pen. They be around the world. And as he calls out, they hear the voice of their shepherd. He will gather them together. That's the call of the shepherd, understanding he is the one who brings them together. Now we find that in verses uh, 10 through 12, where we have these other patterns that are going on with what the Lord has done. Bringing them out of Egypt, drying up the Nile, recounting these water events, how the Lord is the one who goes into the sea of trouble. I mean, it's important to understand water in the Old Testament. You know, nowadays we, we think of swimming, we, we think that water is not that big of a deal, it's something children play in. It's something that, that we play in. It's, it's enjoyable. It's, it's almost a luxury. That wasn't the thought. The thought is, is water is scary. You don't know what's in the bottom of the sea. You, you don't know what's there. You stay away because you don't know what's going to snatch you. You don't know what's going to grab you. Water is, is where the dead go. It's a mysterious place. It's not something nice that children play in. It is dangerous and it is treacherous. So when the Lord says he's going to dry up the Nile. He's basically saying, I'm taking the riches out of these great nations who think they're mighty and powerful. How the Lord recalls leading his people through the Red Sea on dry land. 
Then he swallows the Egyptians, showing the tyranny of the sea. When God's on your side, you have nothing to fear. But when he's against you, you have everything to fear. Ultimately, how Egypt, thinking they're strong in a world power, we see that they did not stand. The Lord is the one who makes his name strong. The Lord is the one who will do this. Now, in terms of seeing this fulfillment and seeing the false shepherds that Christ encounters versus the true shepherds, we do have an example of this in the New Testament, well, several examples, but the two I want to call to your mind that I think clearly contrast this reality. We think of when Christ is betrayed by Judas. And after he dies, and it's reported that Christ has died, Judas didn't know that they were going to condemn him to death. Judas is guilty over this. Maybe they could rough Christ up. Maybe they could arrest him. But crucifixion, that, that's a little extreme. Judas doesn't want to be part of this. So Judas goes to the leaders of Israel, and he throws down the 30 pieces of silver, and says, this is blood money. I don't want it. I want no part of it. Now these same men who most likely came to Judas to betray Christ and conspired with him, turn to Judas and say, well, what is that to us? It's not our problem. You're the one who did it. It's your blood money. You know what? We can't use this money to put it back in the treasury. We're going to buy a field for sojourners. You see, this is not discerning what is right. This is not sitting before Judas and saying, my goodness, what, what have we done? We've conspired to take an innocent man and send him to death, and we never evaluated his message and wrestled with maybe if our system is wrong and he's right, and maybe we need to conform to him. No. Like those engaged in idolatry, here are the terms of our God. Here's the terms of our system. You do not meet the terms of our system. Therefore, you are not the true God. You go to death. And so you find there that the leaders of Israel do not encourage Judas to turn to Christ at all. They do not turn to Christ. How does Judas respond? He doesn't turn to Christ. He hangs himself. He commits suicide to try and appease his guilty conscience. But that's not going to work. That's not going to bring about a redemption. We find another example. We think of Peter's Pentecost sermon. Peter preaches a wonderful sermon about the significance of Christ, the significance of the Spirit being poured out. And as Peter preaches this sermon, as one of the apostles chosen by Christ to shepherd his people, Ephesians 2.20, prophets, apostles, uh, being the foundation, Christ being the cornerstone, the people who listen to Peter's sermon are cut to the heart. And, and they don't know what to do. They, they say to Peter, well, what do we do? We're cut to the heart. We've done a horrible thing. We were in Pilate's courtroom chanting, crucify him. He has died. How, what can we do to overcome this? How, how do we live with ourselves after doing this? Does Peter say, well, I don't want your blood money. I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a field so we can bury sojourners in it when, when they walk into land because that's how we baptize them. No, Peter says something else. Peter says them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone the Lord our God calls to himself. Acts 2, 38. Think about that call. We heard that, the shepherd whistles for his people, calls for his people. Peter himself has experienced that gracious call, hasn't he? Denies his Lord three times. Christ comes and says, feed my sheep, Peter, three times. Peter cut to the heart, realizing the forgiveness of Christ. When we understand this reality, it's a call for us to put on the yoke of Christ, it's a call for us to ask ourselves before our Lord and our Savior, how do we walk more consistently as your disciples? What needs to be put to death? How, how do we live this out before your face? And again, it's not by our works. We're doing this in the confidence of Christ. And so in conclusion, we return to our initial question. How did Jacob ultimately prevail? 
If you know the story in Genesis 32, you know that Jacob clung to the man who wrestled with him because he knew it was God. He finally understood how one realizes the promises of God. It's not in his strength. It's not in his flesh. It's not in his actions. It's clinging to the living God and desiring to bring glory to him. Understanding that the Lord shows his strength in the midst of weakness. In terms of the grace of God, of how we live this out, we desire then to discern what is pleasing unto God. We do this as those who have been redeemed, not so we can be redeemed. We do this because as his servants we want to bring glory to the Most High. We want to live on his terms and not make him live on our terms. We do this as a people who do it, as, how, as the Catechism puts it so well, out of gratitude, out of gratitude. Yes, there's an obligation for every human being to live unto God. But as those who are redeemed, it is Christ who has secured. It is Christ who has made alive. And as we walk in Christ, we cling to him and we desire to live out of gratitude. So may our God grant us the grace and wisdom to walk according to his ways on his terms rather than walking or making God walk in terms of what we want him to do. Let us hear these words of ask of our God. Wait upon him in patience, believing that he is a God who continues to care, provide, shepherd, lead, and bring us to the glory of heaven. Let us walk in him, find life in him, and not in ourselves. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.